Well, Johnny Ringo, you look like somebody just walked over your grave. Toast to Val. Don't know him, but he seems like a real nice guy. Got nothing against him. He played that role of Doc Holliday very, very well. Must have had himself in the right place at the right time. It's amazing in this world what makes somebody somebody and another nobody. But um, he seems like a a good guy, so good for him. This is podcast number four of the series of inspirational messages. Now this one I've titled The Strong Finish and semi-titled it with a Unconditional Love. And affectionately all these are kind of known as the fireside chat. And I got the candle and I usually have something warm to drink but I I kind of wanted to toast Val for some reason this evening. And that's non-alcoholic beer, so sorry, Doc Holliday. That wouldn't, have, that wouldn't have been your flavor in that day. So I start off usually by, by trying to think of some things that maybe happened during the week at the office. We always have many things happen, and some good, some bad, but... There's usually some humor involved somewhere along the way, and we like that, as I've indicated before. So, we continue to be plagued with the COVID-19, and there are some patients who don't feel comfortable yet coming into the clinic, and they have comorbidities, and I get that. Um, but we, we, did, we went as long and as far as we could trying to carry their prescriptions to them out to their cars and uh, having other people come and get their scripts. So we had to make the call after about three months to get everybody back in because I wasn't able to practice medicine effectively like that, especially not pain medicine, not in today's climate. So um, we've had some occasional phone calls that have had to be made, uh, people that just they're, they're, they're wanting to stay close to home. They, they, they're not comfortable getting out much, and uh, they don't even want to come to the hospital, much less inside the hospital. Um, and I respect that. So I was on a, on a call. The phone was handed to me by Melissa, who had already called. And just for the sake of this, I'm going to call his name George. The patient's name is not George because we have to be very, very aware of any type of HIPAA violation. But I, I, I said to George, I said, George, Dr. Faulkner, just checking on you, wanted to see how you're doing. Well, and he said, I'm dead. And I, I stopped for a moment. I, I said, George? And he said, good. Lord have mercy. Somebody has, has run into the back of my car they, they've smashed my car. I, 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 the police are, yeah, here come the police. My God Almighty, I'm right here at this red light. I, I said, George, please, just put, hang up the phone. Your meds are here. Everything's fine. Just, just, take, just calm down. Take it easy. And I hung up the phone. I thought, and when they were going to do the next call, I didn't even want to take the phone for a minute or two. I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, we had had a very stressful day, and... Uh, and I was like, what, what, what kind of timing was that? And why in the world did George even bother answering the phone? But good God, the things that happen. I'd like to say something about the gang of inspiration that I have at the hospital that I work with. They make every day better. I mean, they make it so that when I'm going in, I, I know that they're there. They're like a warm blanket. They're, they're just great people. And I've got a whole crew of them. And, um, and, and I want to say something about them. You know, Lisa, uh, the lab tech, the queen of the urine drug screen, screen. Boy, I've leaned a lot on Lisa. She's been wonderful, wonderful. 
And I always know her little demeanor, how quiet she is. She's coming around like a little butterfly. And I hear that little tap at the door. I know it's Lisa just from the small tap opens up. Our father can I see it just for one second, one little bitty second. We're just, it's always real sweet, quiet. I'm, yeah, well, what is it, Lisa? Was right. Well, you know, look, it's all clear. It's it's cold. I think they gave me water, and I mean, it's it's like Lisa. Um, why do these people bother? I mean, if it's not synthetic urine, it's water from the why? I mean, so we just go round and round and round and. Um, Lisa she is just she's a queen I mean she she showed me a picture Friday of her smiling boy now Lisa lost her boy tragically say nothing more about that but she showed me the picture of his smiling face her memories and she has fought and kept going. And she is, as a result, an inspiration to all members of our faculty plus members of her family. Love you, Lisa. Phyllis, Phyllis, uh, Phyllis is, she's nothing but she's everything. She's, she's like, she walks around, where am I? Where am I going? But I'm here, but I'm there. I'm everywhere. Where should I be? I, I'm, I'm going over here. I'm going there. I mean, who wants me to do what, when, where, what is happening? And I mean, and, and that Lisa, I mean, uh, Phyllis, Phyllis, she just, <laughs> she, she can't, she can't be five people, but she tries her best to be at five places at the same damn time. So, uh, we love you, Phyllis. And the short time that I've gotten to know Melissa, my God, what that poor girl's been through. And she is a rock in the glue holding her family together at 30 years of age. Just in the short time I've known her, I mean, uh, the list of things that that young woman has been through. And all I do is find myself saying, where is she? Where did she go? I mean, would somebody find her? She's in here. She's here. She's so, she's so fast. She just disappears. I'm like, where did she go this time? I mean, I don't. And I finally, I look at her and I go, Melissa, don't leave me in here alone. Okay? I've got gray hair. I'm older. I don't need to be alone. Just, just. Stay with me until the visit with the patient is over. Quit running away trying to do this or that or next. I'm only trying to go get the script, okay? But just stop leaving me alone. <laughs> I'm usually telling people, would you please leave me alone? But no, not with Melissa. I'm like, no. Don't, don't, don't seem to want to be without her. Need to have my help. And... Carol, boy, Carol's been a godsend. She she came. She came blowing in on a freight train, and you know, I mean, she keeps us going. So positive, the energy that comes off of of Carol. Always trying to make sure I've got some sort of a protein bar cracker or something to keep me going. Uh, some sort of. Uh, just anything at all, she tries to keep me. I said, just, just stop bringing things to me, Carol. You're ruining my diet. So I mean, she, she, but she said, well, I don't want you to draw. I want you to have energy. Um. So Carol, please keep answering the phone forever. I, I please keep trying to answer all three phones at once at the same time. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting to see you actually taking three calls simultaneously because that's the only thing that I've seen you double up but I haven't seen you triple up just yet. Ashton.
filling in the gaps all day long, running. No wonder you wear sneakers. Don't know why you ever even bother putting on the high heel shoes. You can't, you might as well just forget it. Just keep the sneakers on, keep running. You can running from the hospital side back to the clinic side, back over here, back over there, taking this call, that call, going over here, going over there. And we just don't want you to run into the wall, okay? Um, those are one, two, three, four, five. Five. Five blessings. And you would think by that description that we just don't get anything done, but we get everything done. We get it all done. I don't know how. It's amazing, but we get it all done. I see a lot of patients every day. Very many. There's a lot of pain and suffering. There's no shortage of that. So all of you, you five, You know, my dad said, you can hold up your hand at the end of your life and have five people that ever really cared about you. You're a blessed man. Well, there are five right there. So all of you keep pushing and pulling on me. Point me in the right direction. I mean, never mind that I'm usually in the wrong place. Just keep pulling me and pushing me until I get there. Thank all five of you for helping me with that. So, I also have a patient that is, man, she's, she never fails to inspire me every time I see this woman. Never fails to. I mean, she told me this time she was being, she was in an upbeat, really good mood. She usually is. And she said she lost her son, too. It was a bad deal. And um, she said, I couldn't teach my boy to be a man because I didn't have a pickle. And uh, <laughs> I... Uh, I said, I, I won't say the name. I, th I said, you know, uh, maybe that was a little too much information. Uh, but don't worry, I get it. Because I couldn't be a mother to my kids either. And the last time I looked, I had what was left of a pickle. So uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we chuckled a lot off that one. That was, that was a good one. So, we start with our humor. I was listening to what I would refer to as a poet, some music earlier today, Leonard Cohen. I wanted to see him live. He was in New York City, and I came that close to getting a ticket and going just so I, because I knew he was on his last tour, as he really was. And I didn't get to see him. I didn't do it. I wish I had him. Because he was a great songwriter and a poet, and his songs have been done by many people. Um, and he and Chris Christopherson shared a lot of lyrics. So... I've been always fond of one line in the song, Suzanne, that Jesus was a sailor when he walked upon the water. And when he knew for certain only drowning men could see him, he said, all men will be sailors then until the sea shall free them. And I always believed that I knew what Leonard meant by that that only upon drowning will we finally humble ourselves enough to look up to the heavens and call out for a God. It's sobering to come to a point when there appears to be not much of a future. 
just a past. A past where choices and decisions have placed one at point A. When B now looks to be so much better. The road not less traveled, but never traveled at all. Now, in reality, how would one know? How would you know? The outcome. How would you really know? When do choices and decisions not belong? any more to you and you alone. This mostly happens with marriage and the creation of a family because the happiness of those that are dearest to you that you love the most comes first. And then, of course, if there's a loss of one of these people, there's a tremendous agony that only those who felt it will know. So what does it take to know or to have an understanding of unconditional love? Well, most often a broken heart. The deep despair when your personal crucifixion and heavy burden from the awareness that your sacrificial love has gone somewhat unnoticed or underappreciated, that you laid your dreams down for others you loved enough. And you did that only at times to have some of those dreams replaced by nightmares when things went wrong. The love unconditionally given was perhaps returned with conditions or maybe not at all. We know when we enter into marriage that it has conditions placed upon it, the contract for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health. Well, there's expectations, and you know that you can handle the good. You're looking forward to that, and maybe you feel like, hey, I can get through the bad, but you know you're just not prepared at all for the ugly. For me, that came at a time when my wife died, and it was about as cruel of a death as one could imagine. I, I had lost my mother, and people that read a letter to God know this. It was tragic, but, but Tammy, she, she endured a, a, heck of a heck of a ride before she went home. I almost lost my boy, but he's good. He's good. And I, I have to be thankful for that. Very blessed and thankful. Because I've just told you about just two people just in this little episode here that they don't, they, their boys are gone. So, the broken heart, the empty wallet. I mean, just, a, just, a, just enough to give you a mere glimpse of this unconditional love. When you loved but there didn't seem to be a real reason to. I mean, you know, but you loved anyway. I walked into a patient room this week and I, I looked at him and I said, I've got a message for you, I just know that I do. I, I, I've got something I, I need to tell you right now. And he said, well, what is it? I said, I know you're hurting. And I'm not talking physical. I said, you're hurting over unconditional love. And I called him by his name and I said, and I know it. And I'm supposed to give you a message. He said, well, tell me what you're supposed to tell me. 
And I said, love anyway. Just do it. And he looked at me and he said, my God, funny you would say this. I did everything for my boy. Ball games. I was always there. But he forgot my birthday for three days he didn't call. Finally, he did call to let me know that he was sorry that he had forgot. And he said, you know, I just thought to myself, my God, I never forgot one thing when it came to him. I said, I know. But you love him still. Unconditionally. You have to know what it means to have a broken heart to do that. So now I and people like he, we understand Christ more. I know all the people that may be listening to this are not of the Christian faith. Maybe you're Hindu, maybe you're Buddhist, Islamic, I, I don't care. As long as we can dot our I's and cross our T's with love, the message is still relevant for all of us, despite how we were raised or what programming was put into us. But of the Christian faith, Christ agonized on the cross. Okay. Because of pain. Okay, well, we've heard that before. That's nothing, there's no revelation there. But I now know that he also agonized because of love. He loved though he was hated. He gave his life for those that loved him not. There were a few that loved him, but there were many more that did not. And the masses called for his crucifixion because he was a nobody that was supposed to be a somebody. Sacrifice, giving, letting a dream go by, a life not your own. But it's okay because look at all the love. But wait, it's gone. It's taken like a vapor. I gave all this and now I'm broken. Conditional love versus unconditional. Love given when your own heart is lonely and aching. The broken spirit. And are we alone in doing this? Absolutely not. Nope. There are many of us. And because of it, we're better people, we're stronger people, and we're now those that are chosen to be more inspirational. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be that. Where does the inspiration come? The ultimate inspiration, when there are those that have unconditionally, despite the agony, despite the lack of return, perhaps they even had to make a choice to move away to a safer distance because Everyone has their limits, and the level of abuse just became too much. However, love still remains. How does one know? Because they feel broken up inside. So for all those who've been broken, you just take a deep breath. Just take one with me. Do not despair. You are not alone. There are broken hearts and spirits everywhere. Many more of those than broken bones. But you continue. You continue to love because of the inspiration that you bring to others. Christ was inspirational. 
And as long as we are Christ-like, we are too. Pain and suffering is real. Laughter is good. The years go by. So does your pride. But your love remains. People can see it in your eyes. You're one of the chosen. You've experienced what it's like to know even briefly for a moment through humility the greatness of unconditional love. And with that, you are the inspiration that drives others onward and forward. Don't ever forget the power of inspiration as it comes to you through the brokenness that lets you understand and appreciate even for just a moment unconditional love. May God bless you. Take a deep breath of inspiration and sleep well. Good night.